Weapons free. You probably don't remember much about the 2019 movie Godzilla King of the Monsters. Besides not being particularly memorable to begin with, it was also the sequel to 2014's Godzilla, and the precursor to last year's Godzilla vs Kong, which really was the big event as it brought in the other famous movie monster from its standalone movie Kong Skull Island, and which looks like it's going to be the direction from here on out with Godzilla vs Kong 2 on the horizon. And so, within this serialized onslaught of giant creatures clashing against each other on the big screen, I can imagine the whole thing has become a bit of a blur. But I bet you do remember this. The trailer for Godzilla King of the Monsters was, in my opinion, absolutely mesmerizing. It starts off pretty basic at first, we get one of those typical trailer music beats that we've been thrown to death with ever since inception, some ominous imagery invoking a sense of coming doom, and a voiceover that just feels like every run-of-the-mill misanthropic speech about how the world is heading for extinction and how we as the bad humans are the cause of it all. We are the infection. The tension rises as the scene reaches its climax, a door shuts dramatically and we cut to the studio logos. Now, at this point they could have doubled down like, for example, the World War Z trailer did. This one also starts off with a rising tension, then hits us with the logos, and then goes even harder. The trailer music goes to 11 and it pretty much stays there until the end. Another option would have been to cue in some popular music track as the next installment Godzilla vs Kong did. I mean, it's pretty cool and definitely communicates that this movie is dope as hell, right? I'm not even kidding, after all, we're not exactly talking about high art here. People don't go to these movies for the intricate human drama, they go to see ridiculously big monsters trash cities and punch each other in the face. And perhaps it is precisely because of that, that I can't help but smile at the idea that, when presented with the footage for Godzilla King of the Monsters, some trailer editors thought to themselves, you know what, we're going to try something different. This video was brought to you by the brand new Nebula Classes, where you can learn directly from your favorite creators. Stick around till the end to learn more. Before we start overanalyzing the trailer for Godzilla King of the Monsters, and bring in some other examples, perhaps I should take a minute to explain why I care about two minutes of promotional material for a movie I've largely forgotten about. Why do I care about trailers at all? It is certainly true that movie trailers tend to be viewed as a means to an end, a tool to get you excited enough to check out an upcoming movie, and once you've then seen said movie, it has served its purpose and can fade away into history. As such, it feels like movie trailers are meant to be treated as disposable, or even worse, as potential risks to be avoided. For it is also certainly true that movie trailers can actually spoil precisely what they are supposed to get you excited about. This generally happens whenever it feels like a trailer gives away significant portions of the plot. What have you done? Like that Batman v Superman trailer for example, that pretty much revealed the outcome of the titular fight between the two heroes by showing them band together against Doomsday in the movie's final act. Or that trailer for Terminator Salvation that, while being an otherwise solid trailer, did give away what could have been a fascinating twist if you didn't know about it until you watched the actual movie. Even more insidious, at least in my opinion, are visual spoilers. Trailers that do not necessarily give away anything about the plot, but that do reveal key imagery or so-called money shots that, even though you don't know the context at first, can sneakily turn into significant spoilers as you are watching the movie or take away the impact of a movie's climactic moments. The promotion for 1917, for example, leaned heavily on that one shot of Schofield running over the battlefield, which in hindsight felt like such a shame because it was the absolute high point of the movie. And yet, its impact was slightly diminished for me as by then I'd already seen that clip a dozen times in the trailers. 
With that in mind, it's perfectly understandable that people rather avoid trailers altogether. And I have to say, if I'm really excited about a movie and want to go in as blindly as possible, I do it too. But I always go back afterwards. Because even though most trailers are nothing special and all feel kind of the same, every now and then there's one that stands out, that seems to go beyond its mere promotional purpose, and that, as if almost in an act of defiance, becomes a tiny piece of art in its own right. Obviously we can talk about great trailers for great movies here, like that Mission Impossible Fallout trailer, or the one for Logan with that Johnny Cash song. You could have it all. And despite having its sound effects copied to death, the original trailer for Inception still is pretty amazing too. But for our purposes here, I'm more interested in great trailers for movies that in my personal experience ended up being not so great. Movies that I was disappointed by, perhaps precisely because their trailers moved me in a way that the final product did not. Because they promised me something more. Wouldn't that just be a case of false advertising? Mm, perhaps. But nevertheless, I'm still fascinated by the way a trailer, a roughly two minute piece of audiovisual material, can not only capture the essence of a feature length movie, but on a rare occasion, also transcend it. Admittedly, it has also just been a personal passion of mine for many, many years. Because did you know that I used to create trailers myself? It's actually how I taught myself to use video editing software, and how I learned the skills necessary to start this very channel. But I'll get back to that in a bit. First, let's go back to that trailer for Godzilla King of the Monsters. We had the Inception Bois, the ominous imagery, and the humanity-hating voiceover. We got to the studio logos, but then there's no bombastic continuation. No famous rappers stepping in. No, what we hear are the first notes from Debussy's famous classical piece, Claire de Lune. Inspired by a French poem about the sad beauty of a picturesque landscape illuminated by a moonlight that lulls birds to sleep and touches the soul. Claire de Lune means moonlight, by the way. It doesn't seem like the obvious choice for a trailer about giant monsters and epic mayhem. And yet, it invokes a feeling that I didn't get from the actual movie. As if the creators of the trailer saw something deeper, some hidden beauty that the filmmakers themselves failed to capture. Debussy once said that music is the space between the notes. And when you listen to the beginning of Claire de Lune, you can understand what he means. There is a distinctive lack of rhythm in the succession of these early notes, and a significant amount of silence in between them, both of which contribute to a sense of curiosity and anticipation that draws you in, excited for what is to come, thereby making the eventual crescendos all the more impactful. And although I know this is purely coincidental, it kind of perfectly captures what a great monster movie should be. Now, I realize that whenever someone wishes for a movie like Godzilla, King of the Monsters to be more than it is, the common response is, don't be such a snob, not every movie has to be Citizen Kane, this is a Godzilla movie, it just needs big monsters, lots of action, and that is enough. And to some extent, this is true. I didn't go into this movie expecting to see a masterpiece that would sweep the Oscars and mark a new chapter in cinematic history, but I did expect to feel something. I wanted to be in awe, I wanted to marvel at the spectacle of these primal forces of nature that undermine our own sense of grandeur. I wanted to feel small in the face of something bigger. But unfortunately, the movie just didn't do that for me. I don't want to write a whole essay about it, but in essence, what it came down to is that there was just no space between the notes. The editing was too fast-paced, which on a moment-to-moment -moment level didn't allow for shots to breathe, and which on a scene-to-scene -scene level didn't allow for tension to build into genuine anticipation, nor for climactic resolutions to feel like genuine exhalations. 
Also, while not being bad by any means, the sound design and the musical score never truly elevated the image into something more. And lastly, and yes, I have to say it, the characters and their stories were severely underdeveloped. And although you might believe you do not need solid characters and proper storytelling in your monster movie, you really, really do. Without it, all the action, all the spectacle just becomes visual noise. For contrast, the Godzilla movie that came out before it, while definitely having its own issues, did manage to effectively build tension for each of its set pieces and create those grand moments of awe-inspiring spectacle. I still remember that airport scene, for example, where the camera slowly pans along a crowd of people watching a series of fiery explosions and rising chaos to reveal... And let's not forget about that beautifully composed halo jump where we make a hellish descent into darkness as a group of soldiers pierce through layers of the atmosphere, as if diving straight into the underworld, to find a world in ruins, and to face the monsters that dwell within it. Godzilla, King of the Monsters, at least for me, never really reaches such heights, but the trailer absolutely does. I don't think it's a coincidence that the first part of the trailer relies heavily on the movie's nighttime scenes. We first see the quite wondrous introduction of Mothra, a more gentle titan that is not just grotesque and imposing, but also undeniably beautiful as it emanates a bluish light that feels reminiscent of the kind of moonlight captured by Debussy's Claire de Lune. We then build up the intensity as Godzilla rises out of the ocean, charging up his atomic breath in that same bluish color tone against the dark, rainy sky. And then, finally... I think it is right here, with these exact two shots, infused with that sense of dreadful beauty, that these already giant monsters are elevated into something even greater, not just forces of mere destruction, but as agents of some kind of divine reckoning. The remainder of the trailer then also picks out just the right shots, all those fleeting moments of provocative imagery that, under this framing, feel almost biblical, as modern manifestations of ancient mythologies, a beautiful symphony of apocalyptic mayhem. Speaking of apocalyptic mayhem, do you remember the 2011 movie Battle Los Angeles? I don't really either. I know I saw it when it came out and that I thought it was pretty okay, not bad by any means. But now, for the life of me, I couldn't tell you any of the plot points beyond its basic premise of humanity fighting against an alien invasion. But here again, I do vividly remember the trailer. The I won't bore you with another drawn-out dissection, but what I found so specifically fascinating about this trailer is that it has no dialogue or voiceover whatsoever. Now, that in itself is not particularly original or groundbreaking. The trailer for Signs in 2002, for example, is virtually the same. This one also started out with vintage images of supposed extraterrestrial contact, then cuts to clips from the movie interspersed with some ominous sounding taglines as we hear a musical track that slowly builds in intensity until the title drops. In fact, both of these trailers seem to be inspired by Alien, which already had a similar and, I have to say, a fantastic trailer, all the way back in 1979. But whereas with Signs and Alien the final product feels closer to what you get in the trailer, with Battle Los Angeles there is, again, that sense of discrepancy. A sense that the story that is promoted captures something different, something deeper even, than the actual movie does by picking out just the right music, just the right clips, and by carefully editing them together in a way that really focuses on what is implied instead of on what is. The trailer conveys a beautifully crafted atmosphere of absolute desperation in the face of an unexpected and overwhelming attack on our being. Besides this being another case of the trailer makers going above and beyond and pouring all their creativity in a tiny piece of promotional material, 
it is here that we can also see, with much greater clarity, what it is that a movie trailer actually does, what it can do, or perhaps even what it should do. For while a trailer can certainly reveal things about the plot of a movie, about its premise, about its characters and thematic elements, in its essence it is still a distillation, a compression, and as such, what it can communicate very effectively is a feeling. I started making trailers when I was a teenager, just for the fun of it. And over the years I accidentally became somewhat skillful at it. What really happened here? The reporters blamed you for sinking the tanker. Otacon, me, we were used. I mostly made trailers for video games, and in particular for the Metal Gear Solid series. In part because I was a huge Metal Gear Solid nerd, in part because those games had a wealth of cutscenes that I could cut and recut into dozens of distinctive trailers. I quickly realized that in doing so, I could also significantly shape and reshape the tone of the games. For example, I could turn Metal Gear Solid 3 into an action spectacle by using music from a James Bond trailer. or into a more contemplative reflection on war if I used as a template the trailer for Terence Malick's The Tree of Life. What did you see? What was it that made you want to change sides? I saw the universe. People and countries are both changed by their environment and by the times. It was obviously fun to play around with all the possibilities offered by this kind of freedom. But over the years, I also came to realize that my passion for trailers ran deeper than merely playing around with different vibes and tonalities. That they had a subtle power of their own, separate from whatever product or piece of media they were supposedly representing. Is this the real life? Let me have you, Donald, please! In hindsight, we should probably have seen the warning signs that Suicide Squad was going to be, well, you know. This is Katana! She's got my back! Her sword traps the souls of its victims. Looking back at its main trailer, it barely sets up a real story, hardly touches on the main villain, and just seems to dance around what would eventually be revealed as a total lack of cohesion. But the thing is, at the time, nobody cared about these potential issues. The trailer for Suicide Squad, as far as I can tell, is still one of the most popular ones in recent memory. And that was solely because of one thing. And no, I don't mean Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, though that certainly was an inspired choice here. No, what I mean is that the whole trailer was just pure vibe. One of ecstatic chaos, of glorious madness and sheer entertainment. And the real beauty of it was that it did not merely communicate what the movie would supposedly be about but that it also ignited those feelings within the viewer. It did not just make you want to sprint to your local theater right that instant to see the movie. It directly drew you into that vibe of letting go and going crazy for a bit. And that to me is the real power of a movie trailer, that even within the span of a minute or two, sort of like a piece of music, it can convey so effectively a specific tone, an emotionality that rouses, and that sometimes can be genuinely and overwhelmingly moving. It's almost hard to imagine now, given how divisive the state of Star Wars fandom is. But as the promotional material for The Force Awakens was releasing, first two teaser trailers and then the main one, there was a collective cultural moment there that was quite unlike anything else I had experienced. An anticipation that, I think, would not have been achieved with the quote-unquote facts alone. Not with the news surrounding the casting, or the director, or the promises to honor the franchise's long-lasting legacy. No, I'm pretty sure that feeling was there purely because of the way the trailers captured and invoked within everyone something more, something deeper, than a new Star Wars movie. For a brief moment they had us believing that the magic of old would be recaptured, that we would once more enjoy this franchise, and maybe even cinema in general, like we did when we were kids. 
It felt like coming home, in a way. And as such, it revealed just how far we had strayed, how disconnected we had become, and just how much we desire to once more have some shared artifact, some new collective myth that would bring everything together again, that would make everything all right again. But of course, just as the trailers themselves, the moment they inspired was a short and fleeting one. Like awakening from a dream, when reality came around, disillusionment soon followed. That's not how the Force works. It's easy to look back now, as one can do with every great trailer for a movie that didn't quite live up to it, and see the artist's hand, see the manipulation. And sometimes this certainly is a real problem. I think The Grey with Liam Neeson is a fantastic exploration of humanity's relation to mortality. But the trailer made it look like it was taken but with wolves. And even included, as unfortunately seems to be happening more nowadays, footage that wasn't in the actual movie. But more often than not, when you feel like you have just watched a perfect movie trailer, it's probably not so much that you were genuinely excited about the movie, but more so that you were just moved by the trailer. That you've simply experienced a tiny piece of art that, even if you revisit it now, still stands on its own. Though I certainly made some trailers just for the fun of it, I found that with most of them, what I was essentially doing was trying to articulate and relive all the different emotions that I experienced while playing my favorite games. And as such, they were more than just promotional tools. They also became these miniature channels for some kind of catharsis, some kind of validation that affirmed that whatever I felt was in fact there, that the emotional essence of my experience could be reconstructed into this tiny two minute or so nugget that I could carry with me. And the same goes for all of my favorite movie trailers. Sure, sometimes I rewatch them to briefly re-experience a movie I love. But more often than not, I just enjoy them in their own right. Because they make me feel excited, purposeful, contemplative. Because they fill me with courage, with motivation, hope and wonder. Because, like any other art form, they just move me. And I wanted to share that. As these little compressions of an emotional experience, I think that trailers can also have a great value in the opposite direction, especially if you're an aspiring filmmaker, writer, or some other kind of artist. Because if, instead of making something and then working backwards to construct the best possible trailer for it, you first try to imagine what the trailer would look like, what it would feel like, what you want it to feel like, you can really distill the heart of your project to pinpoint the emotional essence, the soul that drives everything else, and then use it as a guiding light as you move forward. But to learn more about such creative endeavors, I highly recommend you check out Nebula Classes, the brand new part of Nebula where you can learn directly from your favorite creators in high quality productions. Patrick Willems just released his How to Make a Movie class there, which also touches on the importance of knowing your core idea, or the soon-to-be trailer for your project, and offers a ton of practical advice from his personal experience to make it all a reality. And that's just one of many classes that are available right now, with a lot more, including one of yours truly, that are soon to follow. As a creator-owned streaming platform, Nebula was already the go-to place to support your favorite independent creators, to watch videos without any ads or sponsors, and to enjoy a ton of exclusive material. Not just bonus videos of mine, like my full-length video essay on Jurassic World Dominion, but also from creators like Thomas Flight, Jacob Keller, Story Mode, and Real Life Lore, who all offer exclusive videos that you cannot watch anywhere else. And now, with Nebula Glasses, that sheer wealth of content is only growing bigger and bigger. To sign up, you can use my personal link, also found in the description below, to get both Nebula and Nebula Glasses with a $30 discount. Or in case you are already a Nebula user who signed up using the Curiosity Stream bundle, you can use this same link to upgrade to Glasses, also for a discounted rate. So be sure to check out nebulaclasses.com slash likestoriesofold 
to start watching, start learning and to become part of our amazing platform today.